Who the f*** are these stewards? We never meet any of them. Who are these guys? Who are these people? They don't come up for interview afterwards. They don't explain their decisions. They're just like, oh, the stewards are looking at it. Who are these people? I just think you need to know who these people are because it also adds, it, we need to, I, I just don't think anything should be secret in, in sport. Hello and welcome to The Fast New Curious with me, Betty Glover. Me, Christian Hugill, sat worryingly close to Betty Glover, I would suggest. I feel like we could get even closer Ooh. if you wanted to. And me <laughs> watching it all unfold on a screen in front of me, an intrigued team principal, Greg James. Very nice to be back. Great couple of episodes we've just had. I thoroughly enjoyed listening to them and also because I'm a boring nerd, watching them as well on YouTube. We've got so much to get into. This is the Australian debrief. We're all well slept. We've watched the whole thing. We and it, and it hasn't been without drama on and off the track. We'll get into that in a second. <laughs> but my God, didn't Albert Park look incredible? We're going to chat to uh, one of our favourite listeners, Misha, who is Australian, who would have been feeling quite weird, I imagine, watching it from the UK, but being Australian. And um, I need to ask, why are you to... Betty, you seem to have um, teleported into the Christian Hugill podcast space. Yeah, honestly, this, this place is unbelievable. So I'm sat in his podcast palace, this room where he's got like, um, what's this, what's this Soundproofing. called? Soundproofing on the wall that he's like glued there. But I've had, a, I've had a little tour of his flat in London, Greg, and mm. I went into his bedroom and it's no, it's no surprise really, but there are little toy cars dotted not, sorry, around sorry, sorry, everywhere. Sorry, 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 sorry. They are not toys. They are models. They are die-cast <laughs> models. Thank you. <laughs> and he's got them in these little cases so that they don't get dusty. Thank you. It's fantastic. And I can see all the caps behind you. I can see the chequered flag um, on the wall as well. Which is, it's, a lo it's a lovely image. You see, it's like two little children just having a little play date. <laughs> mummy, um, mummy can, um, can Betty come over? We're going to play podcasts. Um, <laughs> and we are playing podcasts. And before we get into the action, because there's so much action to discuss... For all the Fast and Curious listeners and viewers that will want to know the answer to this question, what does his room smell like? Um, what does it smell like? What are you pointing at? My diffuser, because that's what it smells like. No, oh, a diff I think diffuser it in the mix feels a bit musky, a little bit. <laughs> did you, when, when did you When did you wake up, Christian? Does it, does it smell in boy, smell of boys in there? No, <laughs> this isn't my bedroom. This isn't my bedroom. Oh, right. No, Sorry. I don't sleep here. It. it, it um, oh, you, you tell us what it smells like. Musky, I told you. So this is his, this is his spare room, which is the podcast yeah, yeah, yeah. palace, right? So he's got yes. a little desk and it, it smells a bit musky. I think you spend mm. quite a lot of time in here, don't you? It's a bit, probably sweat a lot in here because this is where you, <laughs> you talk about <laughs> Sorry, F1. can I say, there's a plug-in air freshener on the wall and a diffuser. It does not smell musky. It smells lovely in here. I've just spotted more toy cars in the corner of my eye. Models. They're models. Um, yeah, sorry, I should have realised that you don't sleep in a room that is soundproof. That would be still a slightly strange. <laughs> <laughs> weird. <laughs> okay, enough of this. Let's, let's get into the action. Oh, before we do, there's another addition to Spoilergate. Now, I really liked your firm stance on this on the last podcast, Christian, where you said it is the responsibility of the Formula One fan to avoid spoilers. And that's, I do think that's true. So I did no social media. I, I was careful with my WhatsApps. And I know that we're very respectful on the Fast and the Curious groups. We've got a few groups and they were all silent until everyone had watched the, the, the race. Well, <sighs> apart from one incident, and there was a race, it, maybe it was a racing incident. I don't know. The stewards need to it investigate this. Incident, no. It, they need to investigate because Betty Glover, as I was about to watch the rerun, which was at 9.25, because I couldn't find my recording for some reason, she messaged out of nowhere, <laughs> Juicy Pod today. <laughs> I'm so cross. This that is could mean anything. Out. That could mean anything. You're such an I, idiot. I understand. I do apologise. I was at a drag brunch last night for my friend's 30th birthday. So right. I was a bit hazy, woke up in the morning. My friend Becca is lying next to me in bed and gets up and goes, oh my God, have you seen the result? And just tells me straight outright. So then then I was a bit hyped, I was a bit buzzed. Right. And I well, she's not in the circle of trust, but don't, but don't bring her, mm. don't let her, you know, infiltrate our circle of trust. Yeah, well, if I'm going to Bringing your bad Becca vibes into our little arena. Just, <laughs> this is like, I watched, and I'm not going to say the name of the programme so to not do the same thing. I watched a, pro a Netflix programme the other day 
and my flatmate walked into the room while I was watching episode one and went, oh, you're watching this? Is this the first episode? Oh, it's so sad. Right, so I immediately... And, uh, yeah, there you go. I immediately then knew. You're, yeah, you're prepped for happen. it. Yeah. So I- even saying juicy pod today, that is, you said that's not a spoiler, and I think it is, it is. because it's, it's an excitement spoiler. Mm. Because normally nothing much happens. And as the and as the, the, the F1 geek on the podcast, the FIA have ruled, and as it seems to be the um you know, the done thing, I'm actually gonna give Betty a twenty second penalty from the podcast. So as team principal Greg, <laughs> if you could time that, okay. Betty will not be able to take part in the next twenty seconds of the podcast. Okay. So let's, oh. let's start that from now. Okay, go. So Christian, where do you want to begin? Uh, shall we, we need to start at the top, don't we? With the person who didn't win. I think that's the only place we can start. So the juice, in your words, Betty, the juicy stuff, the headlines are that there were no Red Bulls on the podium, a one, two for Ferrari, McLaren getting their first podium of the season with Lando in third, obviously Max out of the race. You're back in Betty. Betty, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much. Um, that was hard. <laughs> Honestly, that moment in commentary where they were talking about signs overtaking Verstappen on the second lap was incredible. Incredible. But I just, what, what, so what happened? Engine failure, there was smoke, there was fire. It was brakes, wasn't it? Brakes. It was it was brakes. Yeah, a, 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 a brake, mechanical failure. A I'm mechanical saying. failure, um, as Greg said, to do with the brakes. And I think you know the, the amount of times last year when he was winning race after race after race, and I said on the podcast, "This shouldn't happen. There should just be a thing." It proves how special last year was because we've got only into race three this year, and there's been a mechanical problem. You know, Max finished every race last year, didn't finish outside the top 10, even the Singapore race, which was so bad, you know, he still picked up points. He, he has been flawless. It's so, it's, it is extraordinary as a sports person to, to be that unblemished, but it did make for a much better race. My God, was it fun. Yeah, but he's probably livid because the last time that this happened, it was at Melbourne as well, wasn't it? Two years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The last time he had to retire. So he's probably like, for God's sake, it's Melbourne. Little bogey track. Neil Bogey it's, it's a it's a long way to go to not do any driving, isn't it? That's pro- yeah. probably a, a, another annoyance. Just ask Logan Sargent. Oh. Well, oh, oh God. It's so bleak, isn't it? Uh, maybe we should talk about Logan a little later, but we shouldn't distract ourselves from the fact that, uh, you know, Max did retire, but what a weekend from Carlos Sainz. Like, that is unbelievable what he's done this weekend that's a massive turnaround considering he was in a hospital bed 16 days ago i just can't believe it and in recovery and, and it was amazing to you know he's still got the sort of bandages 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 on his stomach and to have come back and just be on the pace but let's not forget in bahrain he had the better of Charles Leclerc, which is not easy to do and then he's come back in this weekend and right from the off Look, not only back up to full speed, but quicker than Charles. This makes, I mean, there's so many things about this, the, the, uh, the appendix stuff, but also the Ferrari situation is properly juicy. This is a guy who at the end of the season is leaving Ferrari and he's winning races and winning them well, even though he's not very well. We've mentioned this before, Christian. I think I asked you a few weeks ago, there'll be questioning whether they were right to get rid of him, surely they'll be asking those questions again and again and again now. You can't possibly have a driver in this good form and not ask yourself a question, no matter who's replacing him, well, hang on, did we do the right thing here? Now, particularly when you add into the equation that this year, we know that Mercedes has got problems and it's difficult to drive, but bar the last lap, and we'll get onto that later, it does seem like George Russell is able to extract more from this Mercedes at this point in the season than Lewis. Lewis is really struggling. So Lewis will go into Ferrari next season under pressure because Carlos is doing incredible. Of course, it's a long season. The the, the landscape could have changed spectacularly by the time Lewis goes into Ferrari. He is talking himself and putting himself right in the picture for, for the Mercedes seat. Why not? 
I also think mentally it must be really weird for him coming into the season, knowing that this is his last season with Ferrari. He's lost his seat with Ferrari, knowing that he's got to put on a good performance, like you say, to be able to get a good seat next season in a, a, at a good team. Mentally, that must be so hard. And you go one way or the other, don't you? Some people like crumble under that pressure mm. and some people absolutely thrive. And he... Absol- he's absolutely thriving. He was never under threat in Melbourne, was he? He's dug deep and said, right, I'm going to pick myself up from this blow of losing my seat and show them. And that's exactly what he's doing. It's, it's quite incredible. Shall we bring in Misha then? Our, our friend from Down Under, who is also a big Danny Ricardo fan. So we're going to talk to her about that in a moment. Is she there? Misha, are you there? Yes. Oh, good day, Misha. Misha, you were on the podcast with us last year as our sort of voice of the Aussie fan. But you are, you, but you're talking to us not from Australia, right? I'm based in London, but I'm Perth, born and bred. Misha, welcome back to the podcast. We'll get Thank into you. the uh, how you're feeling about watching the glorious Aussie sunshine from. Well, actually, you know, it's not too bad in London today. It's not 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 horrible. But um, remind everyone what you were doing last time because you were you were bat you were studying, but you were put, you were doing a. When you're doing a big, you're doing a big exam or something, weren't you? Or a big piece of work? Yeah. So I've I'm graduated now. I am officially graduated with my psych degree. So now I'm just about to start my masters. Congratulations! Um, massive congratulations! Thanks, guys. Um, it's very exciting. Was it a podium finish? Uh, it was. I graduated <laughs> top of my class, actually. Woo! So, you know, wow! Uh, amazing whole position, as they say. The Verstappen of. Of, of psychology. I didn't want to say that, but if you want to, if you want to give me that label, then you can. <laughs> All the Carlos signs, maybe. Maybe you're gonna go. Maybe you're gonna go. Oh, I think I'd pre- I think I'd prefer a Carlos signs. Actually, I'll take yeah. that. Yeah. Did you wake up at four a.m., Misha? Did you do it to watch the race? I did because last year I didn't. I decided it was the only uh, race I was going to miss last year, and I was so bitter watching the reruns because it was so exciting that uh, this year I was not going to make the yeah. same mistake twice. So 3.55, my alarm went off. Always oh. the right thing to do. And Misha, you join us. We've just been talking about, um, obviously, Max going out and, and Carlos, you know, being fantastic and winning the race. Yeah. Was it worth for you getting up? How much did you enjoy that Grand Prix? Oh, it was so worth getting up early. I mean, you don't want to wish a DNF on any driver, especially one that's talented like Max Verstappen is, but I'm ashamed to admit I gave a squeal of delight when I saw that smoke (laughs) coming out of the car Mm. because it just was so exciting to have the potential that someone else might win. Yes, there was a squeal of delight also from my house (laughs) when I saw the smoke. I went, that smoke? Oh my God, that smoke. Oh my God, that's a wheel. Oh my God, it's on fire. Oh my God, yes, this is going to be exciting. (laughs) And it, it was exciting. Have you been, I don't know if we've asked you this before, Misha, have you been to Albert Park before? No, never. I'm a relatively new fan, so probably only the last two years. So I haven't yeah. actually been to a Grand Prix at all yet, but got my eyes on some this year. Yeah, record numbers, 450 odd thousand people across the weekend. Wow. It was described as a carnival atmosphere. It looked, the weather looked lovely as we're sort of heading into autumn now in Australia, but it still looked really warm that like everyone was having a great time. That is, I know you've talked, you talked about this on the last podcast, Christian, but this is a, this is a bucket list one for the whole podcast. We'd love, we've got to get to Melbourne, haven't we, at oh. some point? I'm going to, I'm fully intending to be there next year. I've talked about it long enough in my life. I'm, I've got to make it happen. How are you going to get there? Plane, I thought. All oh, right. <laughs> I mean, I'll meet you there, Christian. I'll meet you there. Thanks, but the way you were saying, I fully intend on being there. I'm like, well, how, how are we making this happen? Well, I'll book a flight in a hotel, probably. <laughs> sort out travel insurance. Fair enough. You know, make sure I get a check in bag because I'll probably be there for a little while. I might use Skype scanner. We could also drop in things like, you know, how much we love Qantas. Oh, love, love um, Qantas, Greg. My you know, favorite. All all those, the the spirit of Australia, guys. Qantas. Love <laughs> Australia. She knows what we're doing here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we lo- love, love all those guys. Um, that would be really fantastic. Go on then, Misha. Give us your review of the race then. Oh, I mean, it was uh, it's just so fantastic, wasn't it? I think everything was great. Carlos Sainz was incredible. That appendix was obviously just slowing him down. So <laughs> props to him. It obviously was sad for Mercedes, I think, especially Russell, that last crash right at the end was, you know, really unfortunate for him. Not that I was asleep and woke up at that exact moment or anything, but um, <laughs> but I think obviously for me being from Perth, it's a bit disappointing with Daniel Ricciardo and just him not doing as well as he wanted to do. I was really, really rooting for him, but 
We'll get on to uh, George Russell and Fernando Alonso a little later because that's a massive talking point from the race. But we should talk about the Aussies, actually, Misha. Uh, firstly, another really strong race from Oscar Piastri. I, I think Lando did have the edge on him in race pace this weekend. And that's why McLaren had to pit Oscar sooner to stop him being undercut. But then I think I do think they did the right thing in swapping the cars back. So I think Lando very much deserved his podium. A, a great drive from Lando this weekend. But but also you as an Aussie, Misha, we've not really spoken to you since towards the start of last season. You must be, albeit gutted, he didn't manage to make it on the podium. But that time will come. You must be over the moon with the excitement of having Oscar Piastri as a thing for Aussie F1 fans at the moment. Yeah, I mean, he's just so fantastic, isn't he? And I think, you know, also just the fact that he was such a team player, like everything you say is right. And of course, maybe Lando would have overtaken him anyway. But I think the fact that he just let Lando have his moment as well, because I guess he knows his moment is coming. But it's really exciting to have someone young and up and coming in F1 for Australia. I think, you know, Danny's held that spot for so long and it's great that there is someone else now that can share that excitement with the Aussie fans and especially because he's a Melbourne boy I mean to actually be from Melbourne and have all the Melbourne fans behind him must feel so amazing well thank god you've got Oscar Piastri because Danny Rick yeah. isn't doing anything for you anymore what what is happening what is happening well I tell you what before I answer that question uh, you know for, for anyone not following quite as closely obviously Yuki Tsunoda has started the season better uh, and that continued into this weekend. We'll talk about how phenomenally Yuki did in a moment. But, but on the Daniel front, Misha, what, what do you think? What What's going on there? I think, you know, there's just so much pressure on Daniel Ricciardo at the moment and it's kind of, it's like coming from all angles. You know, yes, of course, you've got Yuki Tsunoda. I think if you're trying to move forward in Formula One, at the very least, you need to be out driving your teammate and he's just not really been doing that. You know, Yuki's out qualified him. And although they've been neck and neck for this race, like that's a that's a big difference between them in the same car. To add to that, I think as well, you've also got this like hungry rookie in the waiting in the wings and Liam Lawson. Mm. And normally with a third driver, it's a bit of a question mark, especially if it's a rookie, because you don't know are they gonna be good, are they gonna be but because of his injury last year, like we've seen Liam Lawson drive. We know he's good. We know he can score points. So it's not like it's this unknown rookie. It's this guy that we actually know is a good driver. So, you know, it's two front on Danny. And I just feel like that pressure, it just sort of sometimes can become a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy like it sort of did with Checo last year, you know? Misha, if you were with him, um, psychologically analysing him after this race, what would you be saying as the season is unfolding? How does he approach the next few races from your professional point of view? In my professional opinion, um, I think the only thing that you can do in a situation like that where there's a, all that pressure is to kind of, as hard as it may be, drown it out a little bit and just focus on why you're doing what you're doing and just get back to the joy of driving. Do you know what I mean? Forget about trying to compete as much and just get back and remind yourself why you love doing it and you know you can't control what the media says you can't control what your team says you can't control what the fans say but you the only thing you can sort of control is your mindset I'm sure it's near impossible to do but it's you know it's kind of like what Checo's done in terms of not trying to get to the front but just trying to be consistent. It's been such a long time since we've seen Danny Rick performing at his absolute best do you think that maybe the time has sort of just come and he's it's done for him now. I, I, I think Daniel was in trouble. When obviously Daniel made the big call to leave Red Bull, it's very difficult. All these guys believe they're the best, so to have to see a team being geared towards Max was difficult for him. So he, he felt the need to go. We can all look back in hindsight and say that was the wrong decision, but he wanted to go and be the number one somewhere. It all started to go wrong at McLaren. We know what happened there. But then, yeah, when he tested in that Red Bull last year, it was a big part of Drive to Survive and got the seats last year to replace Nick De Vries. It looked promising. You know, this is a driver that in the late part of the last decade was sensational. The closest to Max we've ever seen in a teammate. Some phenomenal race wins, some phenomenal overtakes. I genuinely thought that McLaren was a blip and we'd start to see old Daniel Ricciardo. Now he's back in familiar surroundings in a car like this. And throughout this season... 
Yuki Tsunoda has been head and shoulders above him. And Yuki, this this weekend, that's probably his best weekend in Formula 1. To finish seventh, thanks to Fernando's penalty, which we'll talk about in a moment, you know, points for the, the lower end teams are going to be so valuable. That, you know, six points for RB is massive. And it, it, Daniel would have wanted him to be putting in those headline-stealing performances. I don't know what's gone wrong, but already three races in. It's not too late. Of course it's not too late. It's three races into a 24-race season. But it looks a long way back for Daniel. Should we talk about a crash? Let's talk about the George Russell incident that woke you up, Misha, which I, which I understand <laughs> because actually the, the, the excitement was front-loaded in this race pretty much. Yeah. But th and then all of a sudden you go, oh, yeah, okay, let's see if anything happens. My God. Now, I, um, I, I hadn't heard the term brake, brake checking used so often. So do you want to give us a little bit of, of, of brake checking jargon busting, Christian? Yeah, it's the same principle that um, you'd use on a motorway for driving dangerously. You know, if there was a driver behind you who was annoying you and you braked heavily, and someone crashed into the back of you, you'd be done for dangerous driving. The same principle happens in motorsport. It is dangerous. You know, there are driving standards you have to adhere to, and it is dangerous to all of a sudden slam the brakes on in order to try and force your driver to make a mistake. It's obvious why that's dangerous. And the stewards are judged. I mean, I could read the long judgment from the stewards, but basically... Please, we saw, please don't. No, exactly. We <laughs> saw George crash at the end of the race, and the stewards afterwards, for all intents and purposes, thought that Fernando eased off in a part of the track where he wouldn't normally ease off and therefore it was a bit of a brake test. The only person who knows whether he truly tried to brake test them is, is Fernando. We can all throw opinions out there. All of our opinions are largely irrelevant. The only person who knows what he did is Fernando. I, I think, I, again, I could be wrong. Fernando could have been being really naughty, but I don't think he was. I think he was just making sure he was tidy and just making sure he got the exit right in order to stay ahead. And, and if that did spook George, well, that's sort of top level racing. And, and for mm. me, I think it's a harsh penalty. Only Fernando knows, but I, I'm not sure I agree with that decision. Fernando did say he admitted that he did get it slightly wrong, didn't he? But do you think that was just... Again, there's going a bit slower or there's getting yeah. it slightly wrong and there's dangerous driving. To me, looking from the outside, I don't think that strays into dangerous driving. And, it, and had George not had lost it, maybe we wouldn't be talking about this. Did you listen to him shouting for the red flag? Yes. It was spine-chilling. I don't know what the FIA are playing at. For, for, you've, it's got to be a red flag. It's got to be a red flag. Yeah, for... it was rubbish. It was, it, was, um, it was such a narrow part of the circuit as well. And so people were having to, having to go basically onto the verge and it, they, were treat, they were treating it like a minor spillage in a Tesco in an aisle where you just slightly, slightly move your trolley around the flour or the milk or whatever. But it's like, this is a person who might be quite seriously hurt. The car could blow up. It, it, felt, it felt pretty stupid. I, and, and actually leads me on to another question I had when I was watching it. Who the f*** are these stewards? We never meet any of them. Who are these, who are these people? Are they the, and are they the same people every race? Who are they? Can we do an interview with them? Let me, let me pick up, the, Greg, you've raised a couple of points there. For me, the key is the driver is almost stuck under the tyre. The car is um, on its side, and that makes it incredibly difficult for the driver to get out in a, in a very quick part of the circuit. As soon as I saw that, and by the way, I've done a little bit of this. I used to be a marshal. Like, it, for me, it's a red flag. Straight away, it's a red flag. Yeah. It's unacceptable that they didn't make that decision. And he was there in the middle of the track. Yes, exactly. It's so it's dangerous. The second thing is, Greg has picked up on a point that's very controversial at the moment. There doesn't seem to be enough consistency in the stewarding. Greg, the stewards aren't the same every race. Mm. It, it's a sort of pool. There is a driver steward, which this weekend was the ex-Sky pundit and British racing driver race winner, Johnny Herbert. For me, I've said this on this podcast before, there needs to be more consistency in the stewarding. There needs to be a smaller team that does go to more races and so yes, more consistency. Yeah. There needs to be more common sense. And, Greg, there does need to be more accountability. There does need to be, and we're, we're seeing this in, in football and soccer, we're seeing this where you know refs need to be questioned more. Um, I, I, they've, they've got a really key decision wrong there in not red flagging that race. And that is, yeah. uh, for me, bigger than... You know, that is an unfortunate incident. And we can talk about whether... I, I do think George makes too many mistakes in in the heat of battle. We saw three times last season George make 
mistakes. And I think that's a blot on his copybook at the moment. I do think George makes too many mistakes. But whether or not you agree that Fernando's driving was dangerous, I personally don't think it was. The biggest thing out of that incident for me, ahead of George making mistakes, ahead of Fernando's so-called brake testing, that is a red flag. And the FIA mm. have got to start being better. I really do I, think they have. I just think you need to know who these people are because it also adds, it, we need to, I, I just don't think anything should be secret in, in sport. I, I'm going to talk about cricket, obviously, but you know who the umpires are. You know who the third umpire is. They announce who the match referee is. You know, you know the hierarchy. You know where these decisions go. So you said you've got Johnny Herbert and his bunch of f***ing Herberts. But <laughs> what, I, you, just don't, you don't know who these people are. They don't come up for interview afterwards. They don't explain their decisions. They're just like, all oh, the stewards are looking at it. Who are these people? It's worth me pointing out, this is not Formula One. Because often people criticise the sport. The sport is governed by the FIA. This is a separate organisation, the sport's governing body. So this mm. is not criticism of Formula One as such. It is criticism of, criticism of the people governing it. I just think they're missing too many obvious things at the moment. But let's go back to the racing. I, yeah. I, I'm not sure that should have been a penalty for Fernando Alonso. And I do think if you George Russell, the amount of times he's made mistakes in the heat of combat is concerning me. Misha, does it you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think with that situation, I was like, if that's not a red flag, I don't really know what is. But but George just seems to kind of, and it always seems to be at the end when the mm. pressure's really on, you know, it always seems to be at the last hurdle, George just kind of loses it a little bit. And whether that's, you know, if it's once, maybe you can kind of be like, it's just a mistake. But the fact that it's happening multiple yeah. times and, you know, he's about to become, in theory, um, you know, Mercedes' number one driver. So mm. it definitely... Agree is something that you need to think about. Well, unless Carlos Sainz joins Mercedes, then yeah. then he might not be. Or Fernando Alonso. You know, I, I, for me, if I'm Mercedes, I'm sort of leaning towards putting Kimi Antonelli in a Williams for two seasons or something like that and going with a Sainz or an Alonso, not least because Mercedes thought they'd got a car that they could make real strides of improvement. A great of the sport is struggling to drive it. Even when George is saying, yeah, I'm feeling more comfortable in it. He could still only get seventh or wherever he was on the grid. Mm. There's, there's big problems there. And for me, that's another reason why I think they need an experienced head to replace Lewis Hamilton because they've they've got a lot of work to do to get that car into a race-winning position. Just on that, what happened to Hamilton's car? Because it looked like it literally just switched off. <laughs> I just don't get it. Stalled. Uh, stalled it. Stalled. <laughs> <laughs> It was a straight-up engine failure for, for Lewis Hamilton, which, to be honest, you know, again, that does happen. I, I wouldn't be, I'm not as concerned about that as I am the general lack of pace in the car and how difficult mm. it is to drive. And you think of what Toto Wolff said to us at Silverstone. He said to us they thought they'd got a car that responded better to changes, that was more predictable, and that doesn't seem to be the case. Plus, it's just slow. You know, it's, last year it wasn't obvious who was the second quickest car. This year... It couldn't be any more obvious that um, that Ferrari are the second quickest team. And then on the basis of this weekend, all right, this is a circuit that probably suits McLaren a little bit more than others. But they're behind McLaren as well. I just, there's so many problems there. So lovely to see Ferrari being fast. So they are now the fastest and um, they are the fittest they, those two, are uh, Charles and Carlos, are by far the most handsome drivers on that grid. And it was confirmed by Bella, who was watching it sort of begrudgingly out the corner of her eye. She said, who's that? When Carlos <laughs> was about to take the podium, she went, who the f*** is that? He's really fit. And I said, that's Carlos Sainz. He has the best hair in Formula One and the fastest car. Yeah. Oh, and also, Bella recently had her appendix out. Yes. So I said, I said imagine you, you had your appendix out. And then you won a Grand Prix the next week. And she said, yeah, but I bet his didn't burst. Oh, there is a difference. There is a difference. Is a difference. Um, did yeah. you see what Carlos Sainz's hair looked like when he was on the podium? Look how big this is. He did have some helmet look, hair. Look at on, that. He? Yeah, he looks fantastic. That volume. Uh, uh, that volume. I what I would yeah. give to have that volume in my it's hair. Exactly, yeah. Misha. That was exactly what I was thinking. That is yeah, I wouldn't change a single thing about that, man. Now, can we talk, we've, we've mentioned Logan um, briefly, but I, I want the psychologist's view, really, on Logan. This guy is really going through the ringer and has been since he started in the sport in Formula 1, let's be honest. So what do you, how do you break that news to him and how do you manage that sort of thing? Because that that's devastating. 
That must have been such a bitter pill to swallow. Like I understand the, I understand the decision. Like I understand that's Williams like hedging their bets. I, I think it's a testament to to um, Sergeant that he wasn't a bit more bitchy in the media. You know that he didn't make I little agree. comments because really he took it on the chin. He was talked about it being a really hard time for him, but he was like, I understand, and. He didn't have to do that. I know he's a young driver and I know he wants to keep his seat, but he could have, you know, he could have really rubbed that in if he wanted to. Because I think a lot of people were quite, maybe not shocked, maybe they understand the reason, but I think a lot of people really felt for him. Let's just briefly explain what happened for, for anyone who might have missed it. There, there was a big crash in free practice from Alex Albon. It basically wrote off the chassis. Williams are in a situation where they had a bit of a nightmare winter. You know, they in trying to stay competitive in that incredibly competitive lower midfield pack had to sacrifice things because this is a team that hasn't had has got it hasn't got the resources that it needs to have and part of James Vowles' job is to build that up long term and get the team back into being sort of a, a modern facing formula 1 team so they simply didn't have a spare chassis which every other team does and therefore, when Alex wrote off his car, they had a decision to make. Well, we've, we've basically got one car to go racing with this weekend. And they made the decision to give it to the person that they thought had the best chance of scoring points. And let's be honest, you know, as much as we love Jane, uh, as much as we love Logan on this podcast, he's a friend of ours. Like, and I do think he's a talent. He's, you know, Alex has consistently shown he's the more likely driver to score points since they've been together. So, uh, and he finished 11th, you know, if it hadn't been for, you know, one of the penalty, one of the crash one of the reliability thing Alex would have nicked a point so it it was proved right really James in his decision this has got so many people talking though so many people it split so many people as well loads of fans saying like completely understand why they've done this loads of other fans saying what on earth this is horrendous for Logan Sargent Uh, a big question that lots of people like Ben and Lucy have asked us is has this happened before it has happened before, but not for a long, long time. The most recent example I can think of, someone will correct me, I'm sure, if I've missed something. Take yourself back to the 2010 season, uh, a very close title battle, and Red Bull had a new front wing that was supposedly going to make a huge difference to that weekend. It it, it fell off in free practice. Um, uh, uh, it fell off Sebastian Vettel's car, uh, and Sebastian Vettel was, at the time, teammates with Mark Webber, and they made the decision to to basically take it off Mark's car and put it on Seb's. Now, it's not a whole car, but Sebastian Vettel had a clear advantage for the rest of that weekend. And Mark Webber was furious. Now, in that situation, there was far m- much less of a difference between Mark Webber and Sebastian Vettel. Mark Webber won races that season. Um, so, it, it, yes, this has happened before. And we do see it to a lesser extent where, again, teams bring up grades and they give it to the driver who who they think has got the best chance. They give it to the so-called number one driver. They have to make that decision. But in modern day Formula One, has it happened to this dramatic extent? No, it it, it probably hasn't. I really love it when top level sport becomes quite amateur. I, I love it. It, it. To use another cricket term, it becomes quite village. Yeah. I really, it's, it's like, oh, can I, can I borrow your box? Oh, I've forgotten my bat. Oh, you can use mine. Oh, look, let me put my bowling shoes on. So, cause I, uh, I, I, there's, there's an element to that which I really love, which is, oh, these, these teams are really, you know, working so hard with, 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 with what they've got. And it's, I, mean, I know it's sad and devastating, but it does, it does show that they're having to really really work so hard with this stuff well this is a team that in Williams that nearly went out of business you know they reached the point where they were struggling to keep up and make money in modern day F1 that they nearly went out of business it was only a few seasons ago uh, the latter part of the last decade that they didn't get a car out at the start of pre-season testing they're still recovering from that part of James Vale's job is to equip this team for modern Formula 1 so Jess asked us uh, she sent us a DM on the Fast of the Curious uh, and she wasn't alone she asked how did they get to the race without all the parts they need because they haven't got all the parts they need. They haven't got the facilities they need. You know, they're still recovering long term. The team's recently been um, bought out by an investment company. So they do now have the budget they need to go racing. But historically, they haven't. And they're still slowly but surely building up those resources. And that's part of James Val's job. This time next year, they will have the parts they need. But basically, you know, they, they had a choice over the winter. Do we make three very basic cars that will be very much back of the grid or do we focus on two cars that can compete and they focused on two cars that can compete and 
they're in the mix for points mm-hmm. rather than being cut adrift at the back. But the negative to that is look what happens this weekend. And, and James House has been very open and honest about all of this, credit to him. I think the big question is, where does Logan go from here? Because M- William's making this decision. It clearly shows how they see Logan in comparison to Alex, which isn't a massive surprise. But for Logan from like a confidence point of view and just a, I don't know, a, a trust point of view, must be <laughs> really hard. So what happens? Where does he go from here? I'm going to refer back to what Misha said earlier. Uh, he's got to just remind himself that he's doing this because he loves racing and he's in a phenomenal position of being a Formula One driver and he did get that seat back when maybe he wouldn't have done at other teams. And and I think he needs to, to turn this in his mind as the start of his sort of redemption arc. I think he needs to go out in Japan. And by the way, it's not 100% certain they'll have the, the car fix for Japan. James Fowles says it's sort of 90%. He thinks they will. But providing he gets the opportunity to race in Japan, he needs to say, listen, it is going to look so good on me if I go out there and I show the form of my life, if I recover from this, people are going to sort of look at me and go, oh, wow, I didn't think that was in him. That's what he's got to challenge himself to do. Misha, we've mentioned Japan. Before we let you go, give us your Japanese prediction, please. That's not a, a prediction in Japanese, although if you do know that, that would be great. But what, what do you think is going to happen at the race? I'm afraid my Japanese is a bit rusty. I mean, as exciting as the DNF was, I think we all know he's going to be back next Grand Prix and he's going to be on top as always. So it's always, I think, going to be max. But it would be great to see Ferrari keep this up. I'd love to see Carlos and Charles on the on the podium and I think especially for Carlos like you know he was saying in his post-race interviews that he was like you know I don't have a job for next year so I think it's just quite exciting to see a driver who doesn't have a job for next year doing so well because there's a part of you that's like oh is Ferrari panicking a bit it's always the best thing about a good sport is there's the main story and then underneath if you scratch and scratch and scratch there's the story within the story within the story and that's what we love to Love to talk about on the Fast and the Curious. Misha, thank you so much for being back on. It's great to have you on. Um, And congratulations again on your your podium finish for your your degree. (laughs) Thanks, guys. It's a pleasure as always. Thanks, Misha. Bye. See you soon. So next race, Japan on the 7th of April. That's ages away. So what are the things in the meantime? Who's going to be really happy in Melbourne this afternoon, this evening, whatever time it is there now, and we'll think that they're on the right track for a, for a good finish in Japan as well. Well, I just want to pick up on a couple of the midfield because we mentioned how good Yuki's performance was. But, you know, those points for RB, six points, are phenomenal. We've also now seen two points finishes in a row for Nico Hülkenberg. And this weekend, Kevin Magnussen upped his game. He, he I said he needed to on the last podcast, and he did. So going into Japan... We're now seeing that battle for the sort of midfield really start to take shape where Alpine, Williams and Sauber are being left behind. But RB and Haas scoring points is absolutely crucial. So Haas have done a fantastic job. So I'm really intrigued in Japan as to as to that midfield battle. And there's such pressure on Williams, Sauber and Alpine now to get themselves off the mark. Alpine. You know, they are just in all sorts of trouble, dead last in the standings. What time's the Japanese Grand Prix? Early again. Oh. Hey, no spoilers, not even, no. oh, juicy race this one. So no, we'll, we'll cobble together a debrief podcast after that race. And please make sure you're subscribing because the next couple of weeks we've got some really good episodes coming your way, including one with Bernie Collins, which I'm really excited about. Christian and I are going to be recording that next week with Bernie. Um, Greg, I'm, I've spoke to Bernie a lot, she, and, and our listeners will know her in the UK particularly, for sort of being a massive part of Sky's coverage last year. Her sort of um, you know, point of view from an ex-boss of strategy was sort of revelationary on Sky last year. People loved her, and I've spoke to her a load of times, and Greg, she's the sort of person that you're going to find fascinating. Betty, yeah. you're, you're, you're away, aren't you? I'm going to miss Bernie, yeah, which I know I'm, you're upset about. I'm so upset. I love Bernie. I love we'll, her. So I'm going to send you guys some questions to ask for me, okay? okay. All right. I, I'll, send, I'll send her your best wishes. So make sure you're subscribing. Make sure you're watching us on YouTube as well. All the social channels are Fast Curious Pod. Now, you mentioned last week about Nord VPN, and I was watching. Do you know what? As as a fan as, of this podcast, I was watching it. And I was like, "Oh, they're talking about Nord VPN." I use that. <laughs> I all I already use Nord VPN, 
and I'm I'm like a paid up subscriber and was genuinely annoyed. I was like, sorry, I probably should have got some sort of discount on this because I use it to watch all my all my sports when I'm away. Although no, it is so good. It's so handy for I mean not I was gonna say F one fans, but not just F one fans to keep up to date with racing for sport fans. If you want to watch sport while you're away, it's such a key thing of going away, isn't it? It's like, oh how am I gonna watch the Grand Prix? How am I gonna watch the football? It's perfect for that. Well, I am in Barcelona next week, everybody. So you visiting... can give up to the sport. Exactly. So I I'm going to be NordVPNing it up, watching all of the sport. Okay. That's a new that's a NordVPNing it up. Is a new Nord thing. NordVPNing it up. I, it might just catch on. I really loved your idea of getting merchandise last week for for Christian, like Nord, Nord merchandise. <laughs> anyway, so you can um, you can also switch on your virtual location to help unlock cheaper flights and hotels. Bet you gutted you didn't realise that before you booked to Barcelona. Livid. The prices you're offered can be based on where you're booking from. So that's what sneaky websites do sneaky things, don't they? Because they're all ge geolocated. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. So, and I was talking about potentially booking a flight to Australia yeah. earlier. Pretend you're in Australia. So if I was to change my location to a different country, that could make my price cheaper. So I could potentially save money just by changing my settings using NordVPN. I, yes, I indeed. I didn't know that. I had no idea. So it does all that stuff. And also it's really good at protecting your data, your bank details, your passwords and all, all your online identity stuff if you're using public Wi-Fi as well around the world. So that's that. That's your travelling sorted with NordVPN. It's very good. That really is good, isn't it? I mean, it is. Yeah, genuinely. As I said, genuinely annoyed that I didn't know we were doing this before I'd paid for the subscription. Excellent. Good. Obviously, you still have to book your flights and your hotels and everything yourself. It's not that clever yet. But to start all that planning and to get the best discount off your NordVPN plan, go to nordvpn.com forward slash T-F-A-T-C, which is the fast and the curious. T-F-A-T-C, um, if you want to do it another way. Our link will also give you four extra months on the two-year plan. And there's no risk with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. The link is in the description of this episode, which I personally will be taking full use of. <laughs> I'm going to do that thing. So where I'm, I'm going to unsubscribe and then resubscribe with the new with the new deal. Anyway, guys, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. As always, get in touch with us at Fast Curious Pod on all of the socials: Instagram, TikTok. We are literally everywhere. These two are going to be back with Bernie Collins next week. But until then, see you later. Cheers. Get out of my house. <laughs> <laughs>